If you've traveled to Samaritz, Switzerland, Vienna, Austria, Shanghai, China, or other heady destinations, you may have had the pleasure of experiencing the art of Ken Lum. If you don't travel that much, you can see and interact with his artwork in this city and at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Lum is one of our international art stars who has a complex and compelling body of work with more to come from the well of his deep talent. It is my pleasure to welcome Ken Lum to Studio 4 to tell us more. Nice to meet you. And likewise, I'm a mm. big fan of your show. So. Hey, well, two fans get together. Why not? But what you do is so amazing because you're called a conceptual artist, which means what? Well, conceptual artist was an art movement, you might say, that, that started probably after, well, in the late, mid to late 60s. And it was um, a, 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 an idea that the idea of art, right, the concept mm. of art, came to the fore over and above any material embodiment for the art. And it was a way of um, politicizing or actually, uh, art in a way, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, it uh, meant that uh, um, the, it, 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 it escaped possible commodification by emphasizing ideas, democratizing uh, the practice of art so that mm -hmm. uh, people who didn't necessarily go to uh, have Beaux-Arts training or going to art schools could right. also participate as artists and such. Okay, so you could be a sculptor, a photographer, um, work in oils, uh, some kind of concept to make people think, That's right. to get people involved, to yeah. change people's minds. Yeah. That doesn't mean that technique isn't important, but it, does, right. it did mean a kind of opening up of the field of contemporary mm. art to all kinds of um, new constituents that mm. were previously um, not, uh, not so welcome, you might say, in terms of the uh, art world as it had existed historically. Okay, would it be like a Judy Chicago or a... Ju Judy Chicago was a, a feminist artist who, uh, who's predicated on um, a lot of conceptual language, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. Uh, take me back to your roots, your mm -hmm. beginnings in British Columbia, perhaps your grandfather. Right. He worked on the CPR? That's right. Well, he, he wasn't strictly a coolie, but he came at the age of uh, 15 uh, to uh, Vancouver, and uh, he worked, uh, was hired as a kind of laborer for the CPR. The train line had already com been well completed by then, mm -hmm. but they still needed laborers and sure. so on. So he worked there for a few years, and then he uh, worked on the construction of the um, second Hotel Vancouver, which has really? been d demolished, <laughs> mm -hmm. sadly. And, um, and all kinds of various jobs. And then in the 1930s, he was a, he was a cook um, at the uh, Only Seafood, which he is also was? sadly gone. Sadly gone. Yeah. And uh, the Only, I mean, how many pieces of white bread did I have there? Right. <laughs> right. But it tasted very, very good there. Very, very good yeah. there. And uh, the soup and the, and the yeah. clam chowder, yeah. all of that, yeah. and the characters. Yeah. And he was really. very proud of working there because um, there was a Greek owner at the time. I remember mm -hmm. him telling me stories that this Greek owner liked uh, hiring the um, you know, Chinese men down there because it was very hard uh, finding jobs if you were a Chinese male at that time. And so he, he liked uh, venturing out beyond Chinatown, he, being able to have a job that interacted with mm -hmm. um, non-Chinese. Did he take pictures? Did he paint? Uh, any, any art in your DNA? Uh, nothing, I'm no. afraid. <laughs> what about your dad? Uh, well, my dad was quite um, itinerant, and uh, he came over when he was about um, 17 and, uh, and, and worked in various jobs, a uh, bowling pin setter at a bowling alley in, mm. in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he worked as, at, as a waiter at the Smile and Buddha in the 1950s really? on Hastings Street. So um, just all kinds of jobs like that. Well, I see uh, in um, your signage, in the uh, shopkeeper's sign, it, it was it a series? Mm, yes. You did. Um, I'm thinking that comes out of your background somehow. Well, I have some um, sign painting um, background because I, I lived not far away from someone who's a sign painter and uh, used to hang out once in a while mm -hmm. in this basement. He taught me how to do it by hand really? and, and, and pin and paper and so on, which nobody uses anymore because yeah. computers have taken over. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to learn all kinds of things like that. And I would paint uh, little signs for various shops on Kingsway, near, not far from where I I grew up and it would be like semi-annual sale and right. signs like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a lost art in a sense. Mm. I, my godfather, Kleber Lagrange, mm. 
How about a name like that? Mm. <laughs> Uncle Kleber, we called him. <laughs> he was a sign painter. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I was interested in sign paintings, uh, hand painted sign paintings, I should say, because yeah. there was always this residual proximity to um, painting, high painting. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I'm interested in, in terms of my own art, is to play off this relationship between high art and, and low art, so to speak. And uh, I, I see that evidence in, in sign painting because there's a lot of decision makings being made in, in terms of hand painted sign paintings as well. Sure, a Hanoi travel. Yes. Tell me about Hanoi travel. Well, that was from a series called the Shopkeeper series, and those were, didn't involve uh, 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 hand painting. Right. But it's a, it was a work that was um, based on the small, you know, lower middle class shops, mm -hmm. and in which you have a permanent half uh, of a sign. And the bottom half would be uh, provisional lettering, right? Right. And uh, and I thought there could be a kind of um, insertion through the bottom half of a of a kind of revelation of the proprietor's feelings, mm -hmm. his desires, and so on. And so it would. I saw those works largely as um, as uh, portraits, actually, even though you don't see a person depicted. Right. They're portraits in the sense that it the text at the bottom was not necessarily conforming to expectations of what you're supposed to do when you run a business, mm -hmm. right? But it revealed something about the proprietor's background and, sure. and so on. We remember the People's War, right. perhaps Vietnam. Uh, I'm yes, thinking yes, Vietnam. Yes, mm. In Vietnam, it was referred to as the People's of War. Right? But of course, there's an ambiguity there because we don't actually know which, you know, which side of the, of, of the political mm -hmm. spectrum. Uh, the sure, people's but the war. juxtaposition, fun in the sun, right. all of that, but yeah. we remember the People's War. That's right. Mm, interesting. I, I'm very interested in those types of contradictions because I think very often uh, people tend to uh, like to mask those contradictions in their own lives, even because uh, public decorum and all kinds of exigencies of mm -hmm. how you're supposed to present yourself in public. Well, you started out uh, as a scientist mm. or studying mm. uh, science in university, pestology. That's right. Which means? Pestology was basically a branch of... Uh, fancy word for insecticide research basically <laughs> right. and I was uh, my curse was I was I was actually quite good at it right because uh, curse. yes I say curse mm. because if I wasn't good at it, I probably would have quit earlier right but because I was good at it, I couldn't quite rec reconcile in my own mind well, why don't I enjoy it and yet I'm good at it right and and your professors probably knew you were good at it and didn't want you to quit that That's happens right. at a university That's level right. as you know That's right. uh, you're really good at something or at a musical level doesn't matter right you want to play the piano you're playing the violin and your violin teacher says uh-uh right. Right. you're I'm, sticking with this instrument because you're good at it that's right and you see this not just in in, in, in science or or arts and so right. on but you see it in I know hockey players who he was such a good hockey player when he was in junior. Why did he quit? Because the person wasn't mm -hmm. happy doing doing it that Exactly. Bad. Or fear of success or fear of failure or fear right. of something. But in yeah. your case, a deep passion, I suspect. Uh, you knew somewhere inside you you had to do this. E Art. Yes. I, I think so. Because uh, ever since I was uh, a wee boy, I always drew. And um, on the walls initially, <laughs> but I always drew and I always uh, painted and so on, mm. um, in lieu of knowing anything about modern or contemporary art. Sure. So um, when I was in high school, for example, I designed the uh, Gladstone Gladiator yearbook. I did the banners for uh, for the various sports days, uh, and so on. So mm -hmm. and and then eventually, I also was illustrating for the BC government flora and fauna ink drawings. Really? Yeah. You know, you would, up, up until, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you could see many of my drawings uh, for free on, on these brochures uh, on, on board BC ferries. And now that you're a, uh, an artist of international renown, I'm sure people are thinking, why didn't I keep that little, po that little poster or the small brochure? Well, I don't what know. What was I thinking? Right. Mm -hmm. Tell me about a biennale or a documenta. What's the difference between what they call a documenta and a biennale? Well, the biennales are much more common. Uh, biennales are often um, site-specific to uh, locale, such as mm -hmm. the Istanbul Biennale or the Johannesburg Biennale, Shanghai Biennale and such. It takes place every two years. And very often the mandate of the show is to have some sort of interaction with the locale in which the show takes place so that works are often commissioned in the context of, the, of Shanghai, for example, right. or, or China uh, in, a, to a, in a larger field. Whereas a documenta is really considered um, the, the, the Olympiad of uh, contemporary art. 
it takes place only five year, uh, every five years and in Kassel, Germany, which is a very small mm. um, city in, mm -hmm. uh, in the western part of what was previously uh, West Germany. Right. What was that experience like for you when you went to Documenta? Documenta 11? Uh, what did you do there? Well, I, I created a work uh, called Mirror Maze with 12 Signs of Depression, which is in mm -hmm. the Vancouver Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. It was extremely well received at the time. The experience is quite um, amazing because the entire city, which I think Castle is only about 200,000 people, not very big, but the entire city is um, given over to contemporary art. And every critic, and it's quite numbing too, I have to right. say, it's not necessarily a good experience. It can be quite a daunting experience. And uh, the whole, uh, the entire world's press corps in terms of contemporary art interest mm -hmm. is, is there. So it's all enormous amounts of pressure, but it's extremely prestigious to be invited. I'm sure. And uh, only contemporary art, not yes. group of seven or group of 11 or anything well, like that. Well, initially when Documenta began, mm. you know, with, uh, founded by a man named Arnold Bolde, who's also an artist and so on, uh, it w did include um, modern art, so it didn't include even late um, or early 20th century paintings, and there'd be a kind of history or chronicle mm -hmm. of early modern uh, paintings, right. mostly paintings and such. And then eventually it evolved into its present uh, stature. Okay, and it says uh, on the brochure about Mirror Maze that its simplicity is deceptive. The simplicity of the mirror maze with the 12 signs of depression, the simplicity is deceptive. Mm. I, I don't know if a critic said that mm. or it was well, an artistic statement, but it's like the house of mirrors in a sense mm. in an amusement mm. park. Away you go, but you see yourself mm. and you read text, mm. right, mm. Uh, about depression. I can't sleep at night. Yeah. I have no friends. I feel alone in the world. Yeah. I cry when I see a cocker spaniel. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's from happiness, so that's different. Uh -huh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think what the uh, reviewer meant there was that my work uh, could, is readily accessible to a quite mm. wide audience, and so, um, but even though it's accessible, it doesn't mean that there isn't um, depth and complexity to right. the work, and so I think that's what he what he means. Sure, and as people walk through that. You know, often if you're just uh, looking at a piece of art on the wall, you get lost in the art, but you don't see yourself. Mm, right. Now you're seeing yourself. Right. So it's ever changing as you walk through the mirrors. Right. You're, you're, you're seeing yourself, but at the same time, unlike a funhouse, which you know the, uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the raison d'etre is, is to have fun within it, right? It, yes. You're redirected constantly to um, these thoughts, these inner monologues, you might say. Uh, represented by these lines of text about symptoms sure. of depression that is constantly calling into question, have you felt the symptom in your own life? What is it like for you to walk through? You, the artist who created it. Well, I see uh, it's sort of like walking inside myself in a funny way. I see myself mm -hmm. in it, and I've certainly at any given moment felt uh, any one of those 12 symptoms. I think most of us mm -hmm. have, unless we've only lived on Valium all, all our lives, <laughs> right. Right? but um, I have uh, felt that and sometimes mm -hmm. a, a whole series of those that simultaneously. Sure. So. How amazing. I can't wait to experience this at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Ken Lum, our guest, will come back and talk about Monument for East Vancouver.